Okay, welcome back. Um, so this morning you heard uh, from folks uh, on a variety of the core tools in Ross, uh, motion planning, simulation, ERDF. We're switching gears a little bit in this second afternoon session. We're going to hear about some pretty exciting applications. So we've got field robots, we've got humanoid robots, and as Morgan said this morning, the coolest thing ever, an autonomous lawnmower. Uh, so first up uh, are Jonathan Gamble and Chihei Tong uh, to talk about uh, field robots in exotic environments. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Gamble, and uh, this is Chihei Tong. We're um, PhD students in the Autonomous Space Robotics Lab at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. Uh, and so today, we're going to talk to you about one single question, and that is, should you use ROS uh, for your field robotic experiments? Now, I don't mean to stir up a lot of controversy, but I think, considering the location, that the answer is not too much of a surprise. Uh, but uh, what we kind of want to talk about is the asterisks on the, on the right. Um, so what are kind of what you have to look out for? Uh, what are the challenges going to be? Uh, where maybe some limitations are? Maybe where there's some things missing from Ross? That kind of stuff. Uh, so give a bit, of a, a bit of an overview of our previous history in the lab. Um, starting from the top left, uh, clockwise, these are photos of previous field tests we've done. Uh, the top left is actually in the Canadian High Arctic uh, in Devon Island. Uh, the top right is uh, a gravel mine in Sudbury, uh, Sudbury, Ontario. And the bottom left is the Bistastin Impact Crater uh, in northern Labrador. And the bottom right with the clear path Husky, which you may have seen in the other room, is uh, actually at the Mars emulation terrain at the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, so as I said, uh, we're from the Thomas Space Robotics Lab. Uh, the principal investigator there is Professor Timothy Barfoot. Um, and the mission of the lab is to develop autonomy to support the exploration of space through robotics. Uh, and specifically, our research goals are to develop estimation, mapping, and control for wheeled rovers in three-dimensional, unstructured, GPS-denied de environments. Uh, and, we want, and we make a uh, distinct effort to validate the te techniques we develop through field tests and analog missions on, in remote locations. Uh, so some of the uh, equipment we have uh, at our disposal is we have um, both an indoor testing facility, uh, seen here and here, uh, with a Vicon uh, full three-dimensional uh, capture si motion capture system, as well as a quasi-outdoor uh, testing facility known as the Mars Dome, uh, which has a long, uh, long history at Utias, uh, and where we can uh, test on some kind of uh, on some quasi, uh, quasi unstructured terrain. We have uh, a couple of different rovers, some of the pioneers, uh, as well as a clear path husky, which we quite like, and, uh, and this very unusual uh, robot called the Rock 6, uh, which has uh, been around with us for a while. So, Rock 6 was actually our first robot we got. Uh, it came with Microsoft Robotics Studio. I'm not sure if anyone here has used it, but uh, we can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, so uh, we use it for two separate deployments uh, to the Canadian High Arctic. Uh, and since it was our first rover and since it came with MRS, MSRS, it was kind of um, the direction we did most of our developing in to start. Uh, we did a little bit of players, uh, player work on the pioneers and the clear paths we had, uh, but the core work was done in the field, and so the core work was done for the Rock 6, which meant the core work uh, was done at MSRS. Uh, around 2010, we started looking at moving away from it, uh, which again, for reasons we can discuss in more detail offline if you'd like to hear them. <laughs> um, but uh, we evaluated box turtle release of ROS. Uh, we made the decision that this seemed like something we wanted to go towards. So we migrated our code uh, to Sea Turtle. It took about six months to kind of rewrite everything to bring it into, into ROS. Uh, and we've recently upgraded to uh, what we like to call eTurtle because uh, no one can remember the proper name. So uh, why did we decide to switch? Uh, the main things, uh, the kind of three main things from a, co from a development point of view was that uh, ROS was C++ or Python, while MSRS was C Sharp. Uh, ROS, uh, as actually we heard this morning, has a distinct decision not to wrap your main, uh, while MSRS wrapped it like you wouldn't believe. Uh, the, uh, as well, uh, ROS handled threading a lot more transparent, a lot, um, a lot, handled threading a lot for you. You didn't have to deal with it. At MSRS, it could do all the multi-threading you wanted to do. You just had to look after it all yourself, and that very quickly uh, became an issue, especially when you work in a lab with multiple people, with multiple development backgrounds and multiple styles. Uh, and so these were all um, strong attractions uh, to ROS. Obviously, the community, as evidenced by here, and all the existing drivers and the, uh, and the tools, um, it's actually been very helpful to have all those pre-existing tools out of the box that you can just run before you know you need them. Uh, you don't have to spend all this time planning ahead. You just suddenly realize you need something to debug, and bam, you can pull up RX Graph, or you can pull up Arviz and visualize it without spending you know, three weeks developing a tool to do that. 
So to illustrate how ROS has effective, affected our work, uh, I'll discuss a, little, a bit of a rough outline of our development cycle. So uh, a lot of these uh, deployments to these uh, remote locations are motivated by science, these analog missions. And so we start off with the mission concept. We identify what we want, and as part of the academic side of robotics, what kind of novel algorithms and contributions we can uh, attempt to achieve. Then we start with development. Uh, we simulate the core of the algorithm, um, and then we, after that is good and all the math is, we're happy with it, we implement it under ROS and test unit test the algorithm independently in-house. Um, after that, we attempt to uh, integrate it with a larger working system, um, develop some sort of field operation procedure for how we're gonna run it, do more testing, um, then operations, we take it out to the field, uh, hopefully everything runs well, <laughs> and then uh, lastly, the, and probably the most important for future work is to gather data while you're in the field so that you can process it and then start again for the next cycle. So starting with the development step, um, typically because there's a lot of math, we use MATLAB for development. Uh, this lets us get the nugget, the, the core aspect of it. Um, while we're aware of Gazebo, uh, we actually haven't used it yet. <laughs> uh, this can be attributed to a few facts. Uh, we're not knocking on Gazebo. I, I think part of the thing is that uh, we have a lot of unique rovers and sensors, and there's just a lot of work to, to bring that up. And an important point is that the hardware is really is available to us. And due to the passive nature of ROS topics, that you really don't need something listening. You can just publish and subscribe and whatnot. Uh, we can simply just test on the hardware itself, and, and so we do that. And so after um, the simulation is done, we, for implementation, we typically write standalone C++ libraries and then wrap it into ROS. Um, the reason being, uh, we work with a lot of industrial and academic partners. Not everyone uses ROS, so this just makes it really easy, and ROS doesn't wrap our code. <laughs> and so for development, uh, ROS actually helps us a lot in development. Uh, it's, we have, uh, we've designed our hardware to be modular, so we have all these, uh, a common interface, a common hardware and uh, electrical interface so that they can be put on any of our rovers. And uh, for ROS, the, again, the ROS topics, uh, this makes it really modular. So, for example, one of our algorithms, Visual Teach and Repeat, we model as there's an appearance sensor, a robot and some sort of flow like this. And so this allows us to swap sensors and robots easily. For prototyping, we did something like a connect here on a Pioneer, it was swapped. Uh, exact same code to do a stereo camera and the clear path Husky. And even uh, on our large Rock 6 rover and a uh, crazy loud spinning laser rangefinder thing. Uh, and actually, our Rock 6 still runs MSRS under. Um, and it really doesn't matter because we've wrapped it and, and Ross allows this. Um, so one of the things we found in developing the academic setting is uh, while Ross makes things a lot easier, uh, sometimes uh, integration, uh, some integration is easier said than done. Uh, we, we need to put this all together with a working robot system. We can't just have localization and state estimation. We need a path planner, uh, path tracking, and, and all the various sensors and, and drivers and whatnot. And um, we find that com complete systems get complex very quickly. Uh, ROS is really good for rapid prototyping, um, but we find that it can be dangerous. For example, uh, parameters. Uh, parameters can be set in launch files in multiple places. Uh, it can be set through dynamic reconfigure, and there's also some remappings. And, um, it's something to watch out for. Uh, we, we ran into some issues along the way. And so I, I think one of the things uh, we're looking for would be some more tools and templates specifically designed for large systems. Um, as an example, this is an ARCS graph of one of our, uh, <laughs> like one of our systems and it's, we have no way of making heads or tails out of it. You can kind of see that the, there's some blocks that you can uh, perhaps some sort of hierarchical method of, of plotting it, but uh, or even I think one, one suggestion is to have an offline access so we can log our ARCs bag and be able to generate this off of that because that, that would be helpful for uh, inspection after the fact. So after all the development integration 
for a, for a specific field deployment is finished, we normally lock our code about a month or two, uh, a month or two in advance, and uh, including and that means all the code. That includes our code. It means the ROS code. Uh, we actually install from ROS source. We install from an SVN tag, um, and tag to a very specific to very to a specific version number. Uh, so when it comes time to start testing, we lock everything down uh, to a specific version, and then we test, like test over and over and over and over. Um, so uh, the reason we do this is that, as you can expect, field, uh, imagine field deployments are really expensive. Um, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of money, and so you need to make sure you make the most use of your time there. Um, the code you bring must work, and if it doesn't work, uh, you must have a plan to what you're going to do next because you need to make use of your time and come back with something that's going to justify the funders who sent you there uh, and make, let you write a paper so that maybe you can get money to go back a second time. Uh, um, so uh, ROS is really helpful for this, actually. I mean, there's all those debugging tools uh, that most everyone here already knows about. Uh, the whole passive nature of um, top of messages and subscribers and stuff are great and helps you really easily to test things. Um, but uh, we have found that it takes a lot of time to test things. And so we've uh, kind of settled into using only every other ROS release. Uh, we just can't replicate the same amount of testing time to do every six months. Uh, so we jumped from C-Turtle uh, to E-Turtle, and we uh, will be jumping from E-Turtle to, I guess, uh, G-Turtle, uh, whenever that comes out later. Uh, but um, we just finished the migration to E-Turtle. It wasn't particularly painful by any means, uh, but, but again, you need to um, be aware of the code you're running. So here's an example of something that, um, that ROS was very, uh, that helped us do very quickly. The top left is what the rover sees. It starts out with knowing nothing about the environment. Uh, it just wants to get from the red dot in the bottom left to the red dot and the dot in the top right. Uh, and it's using uh, a system called Network of Usable Paths. This is built on top of this visual teach and repeat system. Uh, so it, um, you can see it's starting to get, gather information about itself in the world. Uh, but the main uh, nugget is that, like, you know, as everyone knows, we didn't have to write any of this. Arvis just had it out of the box. We were just able to bring up these visualizations, make a very, very lazy URDF, as you can tell, uh, and, um, and just visualize it. And it worked great. I mean, like, to be able to debug why, it, you know, how the samplers were going and how the, uh, the planner was working without having to write all kinds of visualizing code before it was great. Uh, and so once it reaches the end, it'll actually be able to repeat all the way back to the goal using, um, using this visual teach and repeat system that it's built on top of without any actual, with any inc without any increases in a loss of, uh, in uncertainty. Um, that's kind of one of the things we're currently, a big area of research currently in our lab. So uh, once we're finished testing, uh, we have to then start uh, testing at a higher level, testing the operations. Uh, and so as you can tell from that video, uh, monitoring is very important for us. I mean, we need to be able to tell what's going on with these rovers. They're frequently doing um, at least a half serious task in that there's uh, other research partners on the project with us who depend on our rover doing something, even if there might, there is still the option for human uh, human support to the rover, but it's uh, required that you know the rover tries, and that's our goal there. We don't want to have to go uh, help the rover. Um, so we find we find frequently that with a large number of nodes, uh, it can be difficult to recognize important information, uh, and so we've had to build a lot of um, a lot of little tools to help kind of the stuff, the important stuff, percolate up. Oddly enough, uh, well, perhaps not oddly enough, but uh, we found that actually the audio feedback, uh, I believe the package is Soundplay, uh, is really helpful when you're in the field and you're not you know you're not always going to be near a rover to monitor it. Uh, to be able to just percolate up kind of those really important messages like, you know, I'm lost or I've received a new message, I'm going to be trying to do this, uh, these kind of things. Um, we really like the idea of dynamic reconfigure, but we have found uh, that it has caused a lot more complications than we kind of expected, particularly because it is independent of, param of the parameter server, uh, yet they both kind of do similar things. Uh, and so that's something that I think uh, if, if, you're, if you develop in an uh, environment with a lot of different developers that you and for stability, uh, goals you should be aware of, I guess. Uh, and so, oh, it was you? Okay, um, so uh, as, uh, as, as, you, as we kind of said, uh, field data is priceless. I mean, it, um, it is almost literally priceless. Uh, once you, when you're there, you have to make sure um, that you get the data you think you get, uh, that you bring back all your data. You have to make a clear effort to, uh, to, visualize, or to verify all the data before you come back and to make sure you back it up because you'll never get a chance to return. And uh, data itself um, can be useful for years and years after you leave the field. Uh, our first deployment to uh, Devon Island in 2009, the data from that was actually uh, enough to, for three students to complete their degrees. Uh, two of them never even went to the field. They just purely used the visualized data. Now, that was data we collected with MSRS. So it was just kind of dumped into these raw files. Uh, now we try to use ROSBag, which is great. It's because it's a single file. 
uh, and, it, and you know, it's easier to transfer and easier, easier to maintain, uh, and because you can kind of just replay the whole experiment later and generate like those RViz videos. Uh, however, we have um, found some problems you kind of need to be aware of with, Ro uh, with ROSBag. It doesn't uh, log the parameters or allow you to generate an RX graph of how the system is running because it's, uh, it's only logging the, mes uh, the messages. Um, so it can, they can be a little bit difficult to use for long-term storage, and we found we actually have to uh, or pack them back out into, uh, into more um, long-term storage systems. Uh, because if not, you have to. You always have to run the specific code that is tagged to that specific message definition. Uh, if you otherwise keep it in the ROS bag. And so to summarize what we like about ROS, um, there are a lot of tools. It's really easy to use, and it helps you develop really quickly. Uh, the visualization tools are amazing. Um, I can't write any of that stuff, and it's amazing that I can use it. Uh, there's a very active community and a lot of support. Um, some of the concerns if you're going to do field experiments are uh, these user interfaces, the things to, to help you for systems of operation, uh, long-term data storage formats, and sort of an ability to return to specific versions. Uh, you, you might want to test something, and then you develop something new. You want to test it to the exact software that you were testing before. And uh, it should be easy, but there are issues that you may have to watch out for. And so to finish, uh, should I use ROS for my field robotics experiments? Yes. Uh, we believe yes, and our lab is continuing to use ROS for the foreseeable future. There are some little things to watch out for, but it's still great. Uh, just to finish up, we'll show a short video of one of the deployments we conducted uh, where we used ROS. So we went to the Canadian Space Agency Mars emulation terrain. Uh, we're doing some sort of worksite mapping. So drop off the rover in an unknown location. It gathers an initial scan. Uh, this Rounds visualization is one we have to write ourselves. This is a bit self-explore. Enjoy. <laughs> Ground control to major so it drives, tongue. explores, <laughs> does everything, and Ross made it happen. Take your protein pills uh, I guess and we'll take questions now. Uh, call this place. <laughs> okay. So your question is, if, did we do everything on the robot and there's no teleoperation? Uh, in this case, we're testing uh, a bit of a mission concept that's more realistic where uh, uh, <laughs> that uh, you would have a human operator, but it's a low bandwidth, so you would pick just simply waypoints. In this case, this is a human operator doing it, and then the rover does everything else. It plans on the maps, uh, stitches the maps together, and goes from place to place. Uh, the question is, how do we prevent everything from going to Ross out over the low bandwidth connection? Um, yeah, I mean, actually, the way we, we the way we deal with that is that this this interface here you're seeing, uh, which is actually written, I believe, in, it's called Panda uh, using Python, doesn't we don't actually communicate. To the Ross out is on the rover. The Ross is actually almost conti completely contained on the rover, uh, and we actually communicate through it uh, through text files. We upload a, uh, upload a waypoint file and then run a ROS command to load in that file. Um, so there's no, ROS doesn't cross that, that gap. Uh, we haven't, uh, the question is if we've ever lost a rover in a field. Um, they've always come back with us, if that's the question. Uh, we, we, <laughs> We've actually we've been fortunate. Um, we've never had uh, we've never had anyone break during an experiment. Uh, the first time we took the Rock Six to the Arctic, it broke down when we were trying to drive it on the plane on the way home. On the way home. Uh, uh, so we had to they had to fix it on the runway uh, in uh, Resolute Bay, Nunavut. Um, but other than that, uh, we've always been uh, the rovers have always kept working. That's the reason why we test so much, I guess. Um, but yeah. Uh, so we just want to give a quick mention. Uh, we saw that someone had started a Birds of a Feather session for Ross and Field Robotics at 6. Uh, so we just wanted to give that a, uh, a plug for anyone who didn't see it yet and might be interested. Um, and other than that, thank, thank you. you. Uh, let us know. Uh, get in contact with us if you have any questions. <laughs>